Hey everyone, this is Dee Dee from the closet. DM the closet. I'm in the closet. I uh, got a bit of lighting situation. Got a lamp. Put a lamp behind me in the closet. Lamp in the closet. Got the microphone over here. It's powerful enough where it should still be able to get my voice okay. Hopefully, hopefully. Even upgraded some drink. I got some. I got some drink here. And it's just very dark apple juice. I swear. So today, today we're going to be doing part two of our world building series. I'm building worlds over here. Yesterday, yesterday, the last video, this isn't class, boys and girls. In the last video, we drew our map. Um, and this was the first step in at least my process of world building. You squiggle some lines down on some graph paper, find out wit where the different places are first. Now, uh, what I would usually do at that point is then, you know, I would take, you know, uh, I'll take my Sharpie again, I'll draw a little circle and put a dot in the middle. And for me, circle with the dot in the middle, that's your city. So you got a city right here. We'll name that city. Uh, let's see, what else could we do? We could, maybe there's a river coming from the mountains out here and there's a river delta. And so you have this nice little river here and maybe this is what separates the gnomes and the halflings. And uh, yeah, and then maybe on the island, there is a volcano. Yes, and that's my volcano. That's, that's a volcano and I'm sticking with it, buddy. Okay, so yeah, you would start, you would start filling in towns, villages, um, and you don't have to give much detail. Literally, I break it down to three, <laughs> three, I break it down into three categories. So, or I guess four, four. Um, when it comes to settlements, uh, large cities, towns, villages, and then fortresses. So you would have all of your cities. Uh, those are obviously your big population centers. I usually do no more than four per land. It depends on, on how you want to do it, but usually four is a good, good number. And you can kind of tell a story about your different civilizations by how many cities they have. If this place only has two cities and that place has four cities, someone's got, got the engineering uh, game down pat. Uh, then you move to your towns. Now, these uh, you might consider these like small cities, uh, depending on how, how you want. Because, you know, town and village, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish. What I always like to do is always leave room for minute detail. So we're looking big picture here. And so when you leave room for minute detail, that means, yes, the village might be your smallest, literally a dot on the thing with a name, but there could be other settlements, other people living in smaller areas. Maybe there's a fishing village with just a few huts around the pier. Maybe there is a little commune somewhere else. Leave those doors open. And a lot of times what I like to do with my players is allow them to world build with me. Leave a lot of things blank and just have them fill, have them fill it in. So yeah, so you go uh, your cities, your towns, your villages, and your fortresses. Fortresses, you can always... Uh, these are easier to place because you place them on like uh, strategic points. So like here, maybe a fortress... And I always do a square for my fortress. I usually use colored pencils, too, to color them in. So you get a little fortress square here. Someone controls that island, controls the seaway there. Someone put a fort on this side of the river and then that side of the river. So we've got two forts opposing each other. Maybe there's a bridge, maybe not. Some I also like to draw in major roads. Uh, we have our rivers, we have our mountain ranges. Um, lakes, lakes are fun to draw in. Um, they give a lot of flavor, too. Uh, the more, the more access to water, that's kind of the rule of thumb is if you don't know where to put a settlement, put it on water, um, because that makes most sense. And that's what people in real life did. That's why, especially like in America, you see, um, especially the French when they were colonizing Canada, there's Canada again, and, um, coming down into what is now America. They put a lot of forts in places like Detroit was a, was a, a French out, trading outpost, uh, Duquesne uh, on the three rivers there. Uh, I know there's others, uh, but there yeah. So there's like all these different um, places that are naturally suited fortifications for um, 
uh, uh, civilization centers. And then maybe some of, you know, but that's, you don't have to always just take from nature. You could also take from, uh, there could be a, a, uh, religious or, you know, a, um, uh, political reason why a place is the capital or the, this city is there for this reason. Um, and that can include magic, it can include nothing really that interesting. So yeah, so once we get our big map filled in, we start filling in those little pieces, put names down on the page, and then we can move to step two. Two. This is really good apple juice, by the way. It's pumpkin apple juice. I know it's August, but the first of the pumpkin apple juice came in, and I had to snag some. A Sam Adams pumpkin apple juice. Anyway, so next stage, after you get your map kind of filled out to a certain extent, I always go for groups and factions. What different entities inside each, I usually break it down by country, what different entities exist? Uh, there should be, I always aim for like five broad, like you know, one sentence, two sentence descriptions of groups existing somewhere. So, say we take um, our Martok uh, elves here. Uh, they, um, perhaps they have a uh, shipwright guild or something like that. Maybe they make ships. Maybe they have an explorer's club. What does that explorer's club do? They, they, they explore. Uh, perhaps there is a... Um, wealth of knowledge in a library or a museum, some sort of cultural center, and who runs it? Uh, and then is there a religious sect here? Can you make up a cult? The cult of the the Wamamba. Sound like Patrick almost Wombo. Uh, <laughs> but you know that kind of that kind of stuff. You just you just kind of rolls off the tongue and just throw it down. If you don't like the way it sounds later, you just change it. You tweak it. No one's watching. So, except me, I'm watching. I'm watching you. Anyway, so you can uh, get all these different factions down. And once you have completed that, you allow the history then to pour in. So we make our groups and factions. So like the Knights of the, the Octagonal uh, Table, the... The nuns of the goddess, uh, we cheat them in how, and, um, you know, on and on and on. Now we look at, we've got our components of civilization. We've got our, we got our sites. We have our groups and factions. Now we're going to pull back um, and get our history. The easiest place to start, obviously, is when were these sites founded? Who founded them? Is there a founder that people look to, like a like a Romulus Remus kind of figure or something like that? Um, is there a um, an event, a battle, a um, plague, you know, some kind of major cataclysmic event that prompts the formation of a um, of a group or faction? Now, in the world I created, and then I'll show in detail maybe sometime later. But, like, for instance, there is a group of knights. They came about because of their, uh, their, um, they resolved to guard the burial tomb of all the gnomes. All the gnomes of this one country are, uh, it's their birthright to be buried in this massive necropolis. And there's this, uh, order of knights that popped up to kind of, like, uh, protect the pilgrims and the tomb from uh, the uh, to Tomb Raiders. Get that Tomb Raider out of here. Get it out of here, Tomb Raider. Um, and then a civilization kind of popped up around that. And so this one city in my setting, it's centered around a necropolis. You know, so it's a polis around a ne necropolis. Uh, so there's different things like that you can do. Um, cataclysmic events always are good, especially if, um, and this is kind of segueing to the next section, um, when we're talking in terms of time, if you're going to have a history, you want to keep 
time. Now, some people, you don't want to do this, don't do it. That's cool. Just be vague and you won't have to worry about being consistent, which is the pitfall of tracking time because then you have to be consistent or else your players can look at your timeline and be like, this makes no sense. Hey, yo, this don't, <laughs> this don't make no sense. You know, I quit. I'm going to go play uh, Pogs. Do you remember Pogs? Um, so you, um, you have your, uh, history and that can, uh, help you flush out, uh, your timekeeping mechanism. Now, if you are, if you're at all interested and you really want immersion into your world, I highly recommend keeping time and keeping time in a unique way. Uh, but not a difficult way. Don't make it too complex or else you're going to hate yourself. Because then you, every session, you're like, okay, what day what day it is? Oh, wait, the moon's over here, so you know. And then this is the leap day over here. But now this is the feast of so-and-so, which is a floating day. You know, all that kind of weird stuff in calendars from real life. Uh, keep it simple. Keep it kind of mirrored to real life. So, like for my time system, 12 months. 30 days a month, so you even simplified that more, and, um, and then, you know, because I'm always, you know, in the back of my head, I'm like, but, but, but the extra days, and all nonsense, you know, my OCD acting up, but, uh, yeah, you just see you know, some days are longer, some days are shorter, and that they're fine with it, uh, so, you know, it's 12 months, 30 days, seven days a week, uh, and just keep it, uh, calm like that, you might have a little bit of fun with which seasons go where. So like in my calendar, I do fall is the end and beginning of the year. Um, it takes place in winter. And the calendar is based off of this uh, destructive event, the a volcano exploding in a very um, Santorini sort of way and exploding the capital city of this this island. Um, these islanders were the ones to, they were very learned, they were the ones to basically write everything. So they got to name the calendar. Their calendar system got imposed on everyone else. And so you, you still get kind of also the um, uh, BC, AD, or BCE, CE, for, you know, it's the same thing, just, I just always call it BCAD, um, but it gives you that same sort of, um, mechanism, so you can have a defining event where, you know, you're counting down to zero and then counting from zero, uh, and I always find that's rewarding for the characters because the, the, one of the most unique parts about D&D is, the commingling of races that have totally different lifespans and you could have a character who's an elf who's in your history could have witnessed a lot of stuff and then your human character on the other hand is like hey i was born yesterday kind of might as well have been um so you can have some neat uh role-playing moments from that give your character give your um pcs some great uh like, um, I keep wanting to say fodder, it's not fodder, uh, great, uh, material to work with to keep their, uh, stories going back and, um, making it a lot of fun for them. So we got, um, we got our sites, we got groups and factions, uh, we have our, uh, history, we have keeping time, and, you know, I'm kind of going through a lot of points in this video. You know, I'm going through them, and I don't need to take 50 years to say something. Uh, the maps was, you know, a little different since I went through all the examples. Uh, but I, th I think you can get, I think this, you know, you could, you could, you can get it pretty well. You know, I also think I'm going to start drinking every video. I'll give you a little flavor when I'm drinking some pumpkin apple juice from Sam Adams. Uh, so when you get to that point where you've got your history, you've got your sites, you've got your civilizations, uh, your groups and factions, then you can either stop, step back, and then play, let your characters flush it out, or your, your players flush it out, um, 
or you can keep going into minutia, um, or you can, and you can always add as you're going, like I always add as I'm going, because there's certain things that I like, oh, that'd be cool to add this, so like I added a flora guide, so just all these botanicals I had, you know, like uh, one, it's literally a book they could get, and it would show like physical enhancers, healing things, poisons, uh, mind altering uh, things, and I had like twelve for each. So it was like forty eight different uh, botanicals, if you will, or herbs and things like that that you could find in nature. You could buy them as well, and I gave them rarity from common to rare, and their effects kind of scale as such. And it's kind of a fun thing to throw in at them. Uh, your little own homebrew poison dart, and they're like, I take what? And they, you know, you, you'd roll out, you know, 5d8, and you're like, take that, sucker. I'll teach you to counterspell me. Um, so, uh, that's one area where I flush that out more. You can also, um, keep expanding your map as, as you, as you go, and, um, you can put layers on your history so maybe there's a history of the humans here but who came before them maybe the players come across ancient uh they come across an archaeological dig um because that's what happens in all the fantasy worlds is you know archaeologists are out there um doing stuff they come across a dig they they break into a tomb they see this whole other civilization no one knew anything about them before and you can start to tie in your different uh, different elements of the game you want. And I feel like all of these different textures you can bring uh, by flushing out these different areas uh, really uh, will help immerse your players, even the goofy ones. Like, I have some goofy players, and I'm cool with it. Some people aren't cool with that. Uh, I think it's funny. You know, we're a pretty laid-back group. A bunch of actors... Um, but we're not too serious. Uh, but yeah, it's just kind of fun to, to you know, they'll, they'll mess around, the, but they're into it. And then at the end of the game, they'll be like, wow, that was really good. Because they feel vested in the world. They feel like they've built a part of it, that their, or their player, their character is in it, has uh, deep ties to the world. Um, whereas some, some campaigns, and you can do this, this is, there's nothing wrong with this. Some campaigns you go in, you're just, you take, you know, take bits and pieces from the different, uh, uh, guides and you're like, I take that city over here and I put it, uh, away at that city over here. And then they're going to travel uh, through a decent plane here. And then we're going to take a bit off here and I'm going to take a little from that book. And, you know, so you, you keep going and... <laughs> And you end up with a um, hodgepodge of different uh, worlds and cities and all that stuff, which is fine. Your characters might not have no clue where they are, but they're having fun. I've been in campaigns like that, and it's fun. It's fun. And I didn't take notes. I was a bad note taker. So, I mean, you know, that was probably the reason. But, you know, that kind of a, a thrown together setting can work. Um, but this is if you're into building a world, if the wor like say if you wanted to use this for something other than just role play games, tabletop RPGs, uh, if you're like, I want to use this, I want to play it, and I want to write like short stories on it or, you know, write a book on it, you know, do something more creative. Um, I find especially for those kinds of things, having people play in your world, A, gives you some great plots and B, exposes any weaknesses in your design. Um, now that brings us to, let's see where we're at. Okay, one last thing before we end this video. Uh, traveling. So I mentioned the last time, like I like to keep my squares 25 to 50 miles. The way I do it is I will go to Google Maps or I'll just, or I'll just Google. Like if I have, say I want this island to be roughly the same size as Britain. That's kind of what I'm going for. Go to Google. How wide, how long is Britain? And they'll tell you. And then you can divide that by how many squares across you are. And then that will give, and then I would, I would highly suggest rounding off to the 10 at least, if not trying to get it right on 50 or something like that. And that will kind of give you a, a good idea 
of how travel is. Um, you also might want to, you know, until they're able to like teleport ar around in high levels of play. Pumpkin apple juice, man. So, um, unless they're able to teleport around, uh, you have to think about modes of transport and how long it takes to get one point to be. If they're, if they're walking a full day, is that uh, uh, a healthy party? Maybe 25 miles a day. If they're on a wagon, more. If they're on a boat, uh, go look up boat speeds. You can. Now, the fun thing about boats is they move night and day. They're 24-hour movers. They don't stop and pitch a tent. And uh, so, yeah, then, then you can also kind of bring that element of urgency when it comes to time. And when that is pushed on the players, like if they, if they start up here and they start screwing up things, and they decide they're going to go back here, but there's a timed event suddenly happened up here. It's just like they're not going to wait for you. You could be nice and have them wait for you, but I always, I always like to give that call, that that sense of urgency to the players where they're just like they have to make a decision. Something isn't going to go their way, but they are um, they get more vested in it because of that. And they, you know, sometimes they'll spend half the session just arguing <laughs> about where they should go, and that's fine. You know, it means they care. Um, so, yeah, so that's um, kind of all I wanted to say about world building. Uh, I didn't realize this video would combine so many elements, but it did. And I think uh, we flushed it out pretty well. Um, so we start with our map. Just to recap, map. Name sites on the map. Go and put more physical features on the map. Uh, get your different civilizations, who's who, uh, get your history down, uh, I'm sorry, groups and factions, bring in your history, uh, and then layer in some fun details like flora, um, you could do fauna, you could do, this would be a good time to do homebrew monsters, or maybe some monsters are unique to different areas, um, you could have a history behind the monsters too. Oh, and gods. Who could forget the gods, the devils, the demons, the gods, the people, the purple people eater? Um, one last point for this meandering video. Uh, a lot of times when you're playing a campaign, if you're trying to if you're trying to build a level one through twenty or whatever level you start off, I never start at one, uh, but up to level twenty, a full fledged campaign, you have to build and build and build until, you know, what they're dealing with at level 20 is challenging. So a lot of times you don't, <laughs> level 20 is like your, your gods and your fighting gods and there's like huge earth shattering events happening. And, and so, uh, what I like to do is you like make no mention of them. And then just seed them in here and there. Give them bits of what, who the arch nemesis, you know. And we could do another video about this. But yeah, the gods that you put in, who worships who? You don't have to have a full pantheon. It's perfectly reasonable, I think, for a peoples to have one or two gods. I don't need a god for every freaking thing that you can see. Here's my, you know, toilet paper god. And there's my god of dishwasher. And then... There's the god of the um, the street corners. I don't know. So you know you can you can have a good and flushed out civilization with very little deities involved, um, and also don't feel uh, afraid to either use ones from you know materials or you know from mythology. Or to just make up your own. There's nothing wrong with that either. I like to do a mix of both. So, so my my uh, my uh, players who like to you know can't help a bit of meta gaming, they they like oh I know who that is I know who that is, and then at the same time they're like who who that who that I G G Y, um that was a throwback geez. So we're going to have our um, deities. They're not going to be a cripple, a crippling effect. They're not going to hurt our um, gameplay because there's just so many of them. But just have consequential ones in your game. And if you feel like you need to add more, you can add more as you go. If someone's like, hey, is there a god of, you know, uh, of 
Saturday Night uh, Fever or something. I don't know. I have no idea what that was. The pumpkin juice is getting to me. The, the, the juice, I need my juice. So yeah, so all that to say, you can, when you start with the basics, you can then flush out, and as your players ask for more, you can give them more. And if you allow them to help with it, they'll be more invested. You'll feel like you're getting more uh, out of them. And I think everyone's going to have a good time. I think everybody's going to have a good time. All right, well, thank you for watching this meandering video um, from the closet. A little more well lit. I got the screen flipped the right way, I think. Uh, we'll see. This could be a total embarrassing moment. And then uh, the mic is out of the way, so you could actually have like full range of sight here. So if you like this video, or at least got a chuckle out of it, uh, give me a like, subscribe. Uh, we can hang out. We can talk. We can uh, bounce ideas back and forth off each other. I enjoy that kind of uh, interaction and seeing what people are doing out there. So until next time, bye-bye.